relation between the states, the rates at which one turned into another. So it looks like they're made out of just three quarks. Then there's this other class of particles which are called mesons. The first class were called baryons. The words aren't going to do you any good. But the other class of mesons we have to understand as being made of a quark, one quark and one antiquark. An antiquark is a negative particle with all the numbers, all the charge properties, the exact opposite of a quark. When we make a quark and an antiquark, put those together, we understand the meson state. Put three quarks together, we understand all the others. So, we have made a really great progress in analyzing these patterns. So much so, that it looks very much as if, to me at least, that we're very close to understanding this part of uh, physics, this strongly interacting system. But, what's the main barrier still to? Well, the quarks have... Well, the main barrier is we don't understand it quantitatively. We don't know exactly the laws. I mean, I, we do things like I'm just talking to you on a little bit more carefully, counting how many states we should get and so on, but we don't know exactly how they move and exactly what holds them together and so on and so on. Also, there are a number of paradoxes with this quark picture. This picture helps to give us a behavior at low energies of the, what kinds of particles to expect. But then you'd expect that a particle would be made out of only three parts. But we've done some experiments at very high energy, uh, hitting a proton with an electron, which can only be interpreted by supposing that the number of particles inside is really infinite. If there are particles inside, it can't be done with just three. There's, you can calculate, it doesn't come out right. So there's a difficulty. Furthermore, the idea that there just be three particles is self-contradict is contradictory to the ideas of relativity and so on, which imply the existence of particles and antiparticles. And when there are three, there should be possible for the forces to produce pairs of particle and antiparticle in various numbers. So there should be not just three, but many more. So the infinity is not a paradox by itself. The three is more of a paradox. Why is it so simple? Why can we get away and understand so much with just three when there should be an infinite number probably in there, both theoretically and experimentally? Another thing uh, that's a little technical but very paradoxical is that we had a rule back for atoms that no two electrons can occupy the same state. It's called the exclusion principle. And we thought we understood that that was necessary according to quantum mechanics and relativity. You know, it has to be. And with the quarks, we find the exact opposite rule. Two particles tend to occupy the same state. The exact opposite. It seems to be contradictory with principles. There are ways of escaping this all the time, only by complicating the picture. But the simplest picture, just three, which explains everything, is self-contradictory. Furthermore, some people suppose that maybe these quarks could come apart. That would mean the prediction of new states, which consists of only one quark, say. If there were such a state, it would have to have a charge of one-third the uh, normal charges of our objects, for example, or two-thirds. And uh, we don't find experimentally any such particles. Now, everybody's looking for them. But it looks as if, if they exist at all, they have to be extremely heavy. Then the problem is, very good, if they're extremely heavy, how, compared to a proton, say, how is it when you put three of them together, you get a light object that's not heavy, like the proton. There are technical ways of arranging it, but they're always complicated. Every, the situation is, as it always is when we're near the answer, it looks much simpler than it has any right to be. And we have to understand that simplicity and why we think it must be more complicated. Our minds are com complicated somehow. Just like the, the orbits of the planets, which were supposed to be circles, which looked simple. And they were experimentally, they were in circles. So they made circles on circles on circles on circles. got more and more complicated. It turned out it was really much simpler. It was a force inversely as the square of the distance. Which made ellipses and so on. But a different way of formulating entirely, which was beautiful. So now we have our wheels within wheels. We, it looks simple. It, nature is no doubt simpler than all our thoughts about it now. And the question is, what way do we have to think about it so that we understand its simplicity? That's where we stand now. On holiday in the Pennines, Richard Feynman is paid a neighborly visit by Yorkshireman Sir Fred Hoyle, the astronomer, cosmologist, and science fiction writer. At first sight, 
There seems little in common between the study of galaxies and nebulae billions of miles in diameter and millions of light years old and nuclear physics, where particles exist for only a million millionth of a second. But the formation of stars and galaxies is determined on a massive scale by the behaviour of the very nuclear particles Feynman studies. Hoyle and Feynman share an interest in the foundations of physics, and exchanging ideas in the local pub is always as profitable as it is enjoyable. Do you think you agree that the quasars are in real trouble, that the very big redshifts... I think so. I, I, I've had this uneasy feeling now for about five years. It looked crazy for a while, but it's like... You're up of evidence all the time this way. Each it's, one makes a new problem. Yeah. Every piece yeah. of evidence yeah. is the same problem in the same sense. If there were any cause for a redshift as big as that, other than recession, we'd be mm -hmm. all right. That's right. But in the present physical laws, there doesn't seem to be any place for such a redshift. That's good. That That's fits. That's good. That, right. That, that one failed. And at the same time, the same kind of laws predict the kind of peculiar phenomenon of black holes, which we mm. confusing. Yeah. And it could yeah. be that either the gravity is wrong or one of the physical laws are wrong too mm. some physical but, but, law that's involved because i'm not arguing at the moment that the yeah. physical laws are, are wrong i it's mean you would, you would agree that one has to push it through along these lines yeah the you? best I mean, way to progress i always yes. think maybe is yes. to try to be as conservative that's what yeah. wheeler always said to try to be as conservative about the physical yeah. laws as possible and explaining the phenomenon and if you continuously fail mm then you gradually realize you've got to change something. But, but if we you start out by saying you've got to change something, there's so many ways of changing sure. And you don't know how the... It's most likely you don't have to change anything. Most of the time we succeed ultimately in explaining these damn things in terms of the known laws. But it's the cases that fail are the interesting ones. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like the story, isn't know. it? The, the chap with the... Uh, under the single lamp in the street. Yes, that's uh, right. Where a passerby says, what are you looking for? He says, I'm looking for my key. And they search for it for a few minutes. And at the end of the minute, the, these minutes, the passerby said, are you sure you lost it here? And the man said, not at all, but unless I lost it here, I'll never find it. Because <laughs> the light's better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we work where the light's yeah. better. Yeah. Once I was thinking by analogy that there was a time in the 1900s when the thought that the properties of substances were not physics. For example, they would be numbers. We would find a series of numbers, the index of refraction, that was physics. Mm. But the number for the index, that glass had an index of 1.543 and so on, that salt had another index, that those numbers, though the properties of substances, would come from chemistry or something. Mm. But mm. that, they were, it was that time, all the, yeah. it was considered a different branch. Then when the quantum mechanical understanding of the atoms was evolved, then we could calculate all these properties and we realized that all these numbers were really part of physics. Mm, and so mm. properties of substances became a branch physics. of physics, whereas mm. previously it was a sort of chemical branch. Yeah. Then I wondered by analogy, and you know, I always worked by analogy, what today do we not consider part of physics, which may ultimately be part of physics? I see. And I re realized immediately something. We consider, at the present moment, most people consider that we study the laws of physics, that is how things go, given a certain condition, how the things behave after that. But how did they get into that condition? It's considered another problem. In other boundary words, conditions. right, boundary yeah, conditions. We are all given all the yeah, conditions, yeah, the yeah, circumstances, yeah, yeah. and then it evolves from yeah, there yeah, according to physical yeah, laws. We're yeah. studying the laws. Yeah. It's as though we were doing the chess game again, and we're mm. working on the rules, but we're not worrying about how the pieces are supposed to be set up on the board in the first place. That's not our business. Mm. That's the business of history, how the world evolved. Hist astronomical history, history of yeah, cosmology, yeah. how the, the universe exploded or mm. the steady state or whatever it was. It's not our business. It's interesting that in many other sciences there's a historical question, like in geology, the question how did the earth evolve to the present yeah. condition? In uh, biology, how did the various species evolve to get to be the way they are? But the one field which has not admitted any evolutionary question is physics. Here are the yeah, laws, yeah, we say. Yeah. Here are yeah, the laws, today. Yeah, yeah. How did they get that way in yeah. time? We don't even think of it that way. Think of we think of, well, that is that way from forever. It's yeah, always yeah, been like that, yeah, the same yeah. laws, and we try to explain the universe but, that way. So it might turn out that they're not the same all the time, and that there is a historical yeah, yeah. evolutionary question. But how do you see it going? Do you, uh, it's, no hard, it's hard to speculate. No, is it, is it a continuous change, or is it something that depends?